Hi, my name is Seti and welcome back to another webinar in our series Google Learning Webinars for Singapore. Now this webinar will focus on communication and we're going to look at a number of different tools. But before that, my name is Seti, I'm a presenter with Apps Events. I've already done a couple other webinars and if you'd like to see those, simply go down into that description and you will find links to all our previous webinars. Now all our webinars will also be saved onto our YouTube channel, so make sure that you subscribe and that you also hit that notification bell for when future videos go live. Now let's go and dive into our webinar for today. Now today's title of the webinar is all about communication. Now the main title is effective communication within G Suite or with G Suite tools. Now what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the vast amount of different applications that we can use. And also we're going to be looking at how we can use these to communicate more effectively. Now we all know about these standard tools of communication, but are we using them to the fullest of their potential? And that's what we will be looking at in this webinar. Now I'm always going to jump from slideshow into a live demo. And with a live demo, I hope that you will see everything in action and get a clear picture of how things will work in your classroom. Now everything shown in this webinar will work on your Chromebooks. I personally love Chromebooks. Our school uses Chromebooks all the time and we are absolutely in love with it. It is quick to set up, it's easy to use, students love it and everything just works seamlessly with all these tools we will be discussing today. Now I will go from slideshow into live demo and that means that that slideshow will give you an overview of all the different topics that we will be discussing. Now, if anything is still unclear or you have any questions, you can always jump into the chat. Now, this webinar is pre-recorded, which means that myself and a number of other presenters will be in that chat down below and we will be answering your questions. Now, we will be there for the entire webinar. So if you have any questions, you can always ask them even when the topic has already moved on. Now we are also going to be keeping an eye on that comment section. So if you are part of the large group of people that will be watching the replay for these webinars, drop your questions in that comment section below. We will be doing our very best to answer every single one. And if you have any issues or anything that you're worried about, simply let us know and hopefully we can find the solution together. Now let's jump into it. Now the first part of our webinar is going to be looking at communicating with G Suite and in particular we're going to look at these tools here. We'll be looking at Gmail, I'm going to give you a number of additional tips. Now I've already had a full webinar on productivity, this is really about the communication side of Gmail, not so much the productivity. Now a link to the productivity webinar will be in the comment section below. We are focusing on communication. The second one we'll be looking at today is Meet. Now, Google Meet is an amazing video conferencing platform and I'm going to show you a number of different things you can do and maybe even give you some tips on how you can use it more effectively in the classroom for both in-person lessons, maybe parent consultations or maybe even your online lessons. Then we're going to have a look at Google Chat and we're going to see what's different about chat and how does it stack up to Google Meet and what are some of the features that we can use chat for. Then we're going to move on to Google Groups, which in my opinion is definitely one of the most underused applications within G Suite. It has gone through a complete revamp, so everything's been updated and it's an amazing platform to use with your students and maybe even with your colleagues for some professional development. Once we've looked at those, we're going to jump onto Forms and I'm going to show you how you can use Forms effectively quizzes effectively and what the difference is between the two. We're going to be looking at how we can use those for feedback and really get our students on board with communicating both ways. So we're going to be giving feedback but also asking for feedback. And then finally we will be looking at my all-time favorite and that is the Q&A audience tools within Google Slides. Because yes, Google Slides is also an amazing tool for communicating two ways. So let's just get started with the very first, and that is our friend Gmail. Now within Gmail, we can do a lot of different things and we're going to be talking about these things in particular. So we're going to look at emailing efficiently and effectively. We're going to look at the difference between a reply, reply all, forwarding emails and how you can add recipients and maybe even change the subject and why you may want to do that. 
Then we're going to be looking at turning those nudges on and off, and I'll explain in a minute what nudges are. We're going to be looking at offline email because yes, that is also available. And then we're going to be looking at how we can make sure that we don't lose any emails and continue our communication. So let's start by opening up our Gmail. I'm here in one of my demo accounts. I'm going to go ahead and open up my Gmail. Now I'm in my Gmail's inbox. And the first thing we'll be looking at is emailing effectively. What's the difference between those different boxes we see whenever we're composing an email? So let's go ahead and click on compose. And now you see at the top that this is coming from an account. Now, if you were here for the productivity webinar, you will have seen that you can add multiple accounts and that doing that can really speed up your productivity. However, we're focused on communicating. So we're going to be looking at the next box and that is the two box. Now I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and there we go. Now, when I click on two, it automatically opens up my contact list. Now, as you can see here, I have no contacts in my contact list. Where do I add those contacts? Well, Google pulls these in from your contacts app. So let's go ahead and add some contacts to our contacts app. We're going to click on the app launcher. And now what we're going to do is we're going to find the contacts tab. So we're going to click on that. And now I can add any contact I would like to frequently use. So let's go ahead and create a brand new contact. We're going to click on create contact and I can now add all the information about this contact. I'm going to add a demo student contact. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're going to call this student, let's say it's John and we are going to call him John demo. He is not part of a company job title. Let's just add student there to make it a little bit easier and add his demo email account. So we're going to just add, there we go student01 at dot net. There we go. We can also attach a label to this person. So we're going to be attaching the student label because obviously this is one of our demo students. Now say that this person has multiple email addresses. Well, we can attach a second or third email address by clicking on this plus right here. As you can see, we can add an additional email. I'm not going to do that at the moment. We can add some notes so we can say this is a demo student in a year nine class. Now you can add any information you want there. This is just to make things easier and clear for yourself. And we can click on show more and you have even more information that can be filled out. Now, for the sake of this demonstration, I'm not going to fill everything out because I could easily spend about 20 minutes filling all this information in, but we're going to click on save. So you can see here we have John Demo. John Demo is a student. This is a label attached to this contact, which will make finding our contacts in the future much easier. We can start this person. This is if it's a contact we will frequently use. We can edit our contact or we can even click on those three dots and export our contacts and then put them into a different platform. I'm going to leave it as it is. We have the information down here and then we can see the different interactions that we've had with this contact. This has been pulled in for my Gmail because I have added that email address. That means that Gmail already knows that I've been interacting with this person and then shares that information with Google contacts. We're going to go ahead and close this and here you can now see that there is a contact. On the left hand side, you will see your frequently contacted people. Again, this is that person because Gmail has communicated that information. We can also merge and fix various contacts, say that you have a couple of different contacts and you'd like to merge them into a single one. You can do that right here. We can look at our labels. You can see I have a number of labels. At the moment, I have students. I can also create a brand new label. I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to create a label for teachers. So let's go ahead and click on create a label. Teachers. We're going to click on save. And now I have two labels. I have this student label here and my teacher's label. I can always click on the pen to tweak it, but sadly we cannot give these labels a color. Hopefully this is something that will be rolled out in the future. We can import contacts if we have a CSV file or a file from a different platform. We can export all our contacts into a different platform or we can print a list of our contacts. Now I'm going to just look at that single contact and I'm going to leave it right there. In your settings for contacts, you can see that you can even delegate some access and that is great for when you're having an admin in your school or you have colleagues that are going to be adding contacts into a single contact list. I find this a huge time saver. Delegating access really helps you to get all your contacts in there quickly so you can start using them. 
We have some more settings here, but at the moment we're going to leave these as it is. Let's just click on cancel and close our contacts. We're now back in Gmail and let's open up our compose window one more time. We're now setting up a brand new email and when I click on two, guess what? That contact is now available. So if you've got all your contacts added, you can simply search in the search box at the top and you will find the contact that you are trying to contact. I'm going to add John Demo. There we go. And we're going to insert that person. You can see he's right here and he is in the to field. That means that this email is really meant for this person. Say that someone else has to be aware of this person and you want John to also know that this email has been shared with them. Well, what you can do is you can use that CC tag to add a second email address. So let's do that right now. We're going to CC in teacher one because I'm using the teacher two account. Let's go ahead and add in teacher one. There we go. Teacher one is going to be CC'd in. That means that John will receive this email because it's been sent to him. He also knows that the other teacher has been added in and therefore is aware of the communication that has taken place. Sometimes you're emailing multiple people, but you do not need them to know that this has been sent to multiple people. Well, then you would use a different field altogether. CC stands for carbon copy and BCC stands for blind carbon copy. That means that it is blind. Nobody knows who's been added. So if I now say add in a different student, I'm going to add in a different student account there, student three, and we're going to add that account there. So that means that John knows the email has been sent to teacher one. However, he does not know that it's been sent to student three. Student three, however, does know that it's been sent to the others because not all email addresses are in that BCC column. Alternatively, you can simply drag and drop these around and make sure that they are all in BCC and that way nobody knows who's received the email. This is useful when you're emailing parents and you don't want to accidentally share out the email addresses with other parents. We have our subject line. We can simply type in the subject there and then we can fill out our email. Now let's have a look at the next thing and that is replying to emails or replying to all recipients. Here you can see I have an email and this is an email from student one. And at the bottom I have the option to reply or to forward this email. Now I can only reply because it only had one person in this email thread. Say that there were multiple people in this thread, well then I would have the reply all option as well. Let's go ahead and open one of those emails. We're now back in our inbox and here you will see that I have an email with a subject emailing everyone. So let's go ahead and open this up and you can see at the top this has been sent to John, student two, teacher one and teacher two, which is the account we are in. So there are four people that have received this email. This means that I can now reply to this email thread. I can either reply to the single person who sent it to me. In this case, that would be teacher two. When I click on reply, the email gets sent to teacher two, none of the others. I can hit reply all. That means it gets sent to everyone. Everyone will see this message or I can forward it to another person. Say that teacher three needs to see this email. I can forward that to that teacher. Now I do want to stress, do not overuse reply to all. If the other people don't have to be aware of the information being shared, simply hit reply because otherwise you're going to flood everyone else's inbox with lots and lots of email traffic. Reply all is incredibly useful when everybody has to be aware of the communication taking place. Reply is when you are replying directly to the original sender. Now let's have a look at how it works and some of the things we can do with replying and replying all because what you will notice is that email neatly sorts everything into groups. So let's go ahead and hit reply all. We're going to click on reply all and I'm going to say hello everyone. There we go. We're going to click on send. This email has now been sent to everyone in this email thread. And when I go to my inbox, you'll see that there are now two emails inside this thread. Now, Gmail automatically sorts these together because of that subject. The subject is emailing everyone and therefore it is a single thread. Everything has the same subject. Say that I open this now and I want to reply all again, but I want to start a different thread. Well, then I can change that subject. This time I'm going to say that I want to talk about professional development. There we go, professional development. And I want to change the title into PD. 
Now I'm replying, but it's about a different subject altogether. So I actually want to change the subject of this email thread. I don't want it to become part of that same email thread. So what I do now is I click on these little arrows here where it says type of response and it gives me a drop down arrow. Now when I click on that, I can see I can change it to reply, forward, but I can also edit subject. So I'm going to do that now. We're going to edit the subject. It opens up a new window and we're going to just change it to PD. We're going to send this email out and then in my inbox, you will see it has started a new thread. That means that it's very easy to have a thread with 20, maybe 25 emails. And then as soon as the subject changes, you simply go into that drop down menu and change the subject of that email thread. This way your emails are clear, you're communicating clearly and people won't get confused wondering what you are talking about. So this way it will save you a lot of time. Now another thing you can see is that in Gmail when you haven't responded for a while or when an email has been sent and there was a question asked, Gmail can remind you that you should be replying or responding to that email. Now that is called a nudge and we can turn these on or off for Gmail. So let's go ahead and have a look at where we can do that. Now the first thing we'll do is we'll click on that cogwheel. So when you're in the cogwheel, you go to see all settings and now we have to find the nudge setting. Now in that general tab, we're going to scroll down until we find nudges. So here you can see nudges and it says suggest emails to reply to. It also says that it will suggest emails to follow up on. You can turn this off if you find those nudges irritating or if they get in the way of your productivity. We are going to leave them on because in terms of effective communication, a slight nudge when you've forgotten to reply to an email can be incredibly useful. We're going to leave them on and then simply exit the settings. And that brings us to turning on offline mail because sometimes we do lose our internet connection. Maybe we're on the move, maybe we don't have an internet connection, but that doesn't stop us from reading through our emails or preparing emails to be sent later. The only thing we do have to do is turn this on. So let's go into our settings again, go into that cogwheel, see all settings, and now we're going to find offline. Now you can find this in the far right corner, right next to advanced and themes. So let's click on offline. Here you can now enable offline access, which means that you can read and continue to read your emails even when you're offline, as well as start composing some emails and just get them ready to be sent. And then as soon as you're online, these will be sent. Now, if you do not see this option and you see offline unavailable, you'll have to contact your G Suite admin because they have to turn this on in the admin console. So your G Suite admin or your school admin, they can turn this functionality on. Usually as soon as they switch it on, it takes up to 24 hours to roll out and then it is available to every single user they've selected this for. And that's everything about Gmail for communication. Now, if you want more about the productivity side of using Gmail, then the other webinar is just for you and you'll find a link in that description below. Now we're going to move on to Google Meet and Google Meet is an amazingly powerful video conferencing platform that is integrated with so many of the G Suite apps. And so we're going to be looking at some of the key features. Now, as you can see here, we're going to be looking at starting a meet. Now there are three different places that you can start a meet. So I'm going to show you those three places. Then we're going to be looking at collaboration within a meeting. So once your meeting is live, how can we collaborate and what sort of collaboration is available? Then we'll be looking at adding resources. And in addition to that, I'm going to show you some little tricks about adding those resources to your meet so that they are accessible to other people in that same meeting. So let's go ahead and open up a Google Meet. Now, as I said, there are three different places you can start a meet. Seeing as we're already in Gmail, let's start by opening a meet from Gmail. So we're going to go ahead and open up our Gmail. And in the left hand corner, you'll see that it says meet. Here you can see that there is a list of my meetings. Now, this is an overview of all the meetings that are coming up or I can click on new meeting. Now here I will click on new meeting and this opens up a brand new meeting. It gives me a unique meeting link and I can copy that link and share it with others. Sharing that will mean that they can now join that meeting. Once I'm ready to go and I just want to get started and start my video conference, well, what I can do here is I can now click on join now. I can also send invitations and these can be manually sent by either copying that invite, same as the button up here, or sharing it via email. If I select share via email, it opens up a separate tab, pre-populates that email and I can send it to whoever I want. However, for this meeting demo, I am going to be going into the join now. 
So let's go ahead and click on join now. This opens up my preview. And first things first, we have to give access to Meet to use our webcam and microphone. Now, if you have external webcams or external microphones connected, we will show you where you can change those and you will still have to give access. So let's go ahead and click on allow and then also give it access for the microphone and the camera, allow. Now here you can see it pulls up one of my external ones, but because there is no picture, I know I've got the wrong camera selected. So where do I change that? Well, simply up here in those three dots, you're going to click on that. And now you can go into settings. Once you're in your settings, you have access to the different microphones and the different cameras you can use. So here under video, I'm going to select the correct camera. I'm going to use the high definition user facing camera. As you can see here, the camera is immediately giving me a preview. But if you have multiple cameras, by all means, select the one that you would like to use. Then we have a number of additional settings. And these are important settings because if you are on a slower internet connection, you may want to limit it to 360p. That means that the video will be sent and received at a much lower bitrate, at a much lower quality. I'm, however, going to select high definition 720p and then also receive 720. Now, because I'm sending it at 720, that does not mean that every single participant in this meeting has to view 720. If their settings are set to 360, well, then they will be getting 360, even though I'm sending 720. However, I want the best possible quality to be sent out, seeing as I'm on a good internet connection. In addition to that, I can go to my audio, I can see here that the audio is moving. That means the microphone is picking up the sound, but I can also change this to multiple different microphones. Go ahead and click on that X. No need to save anything. It is automatically remembered. Again, you get a preview. You can check your lighting, make sure everything is in order. And then you can also mute your microphone because sometimes when joining a meeting, it makes more sense to mute the microphone. You can also turn off that camera and then simply turn it on as soon as you'd like to use it. Right, I'm going to leave it muted to avoid any feedback that we may get in this meeting. And then I'm going to show you one additional feature. This background, I'm really happy with the background, but say that I'm in my living room or it is a bit noisy and there's a lot of clutter behind me. Well, what I can do is I can always click on turn on background blur. I can click on this and now the AI is automatically going to blur my background. No, it is not perfect, but it is a great addition to Google Meet and it'll make it much easier for your students and yourself to increase the privacy level that your meetings have. I'm going to turn this off, no clutter behind me, and let's go ahead and click on join now. I'm in my meeting and now I have so many additional features available to me. Where do we find these? Well, most of the features can be found at the bottom of your screen. So here you can see that we have three dots and these three dots again open up a menu of features. You can see that I can turn on that background blur inside this menu. I can go full screen and I actually quite like going full screen whenever you're in a meeting because it just gives you more screen real estate to work and talk to your students or even have a discussion with your colleagues. Let's go ahead and go back into that three dot menu. And here we now have the option to change our layout. Now changing the layout will make it much easier to meet with large groups and many participants joining your meeting. So here you can see it is currently set to auto. And that means that the screen is going to jump back and forth between the different people and different layouts, depending on how many people, how many participants are in my room. I can also select tiled. And at the bottom, you will see that I can scroll this all the way to the left, which means that my tiled view is going to use six people on the screen, or I can go all the way to the right. And then I have 49 people on the screen. So if you know that you are going to have a large meeting with many people, you can scroll this all the way up and then many more people will be visible on your screen. We also have these spotlights. That means that the screen will show whoever is speaking. This can get confusing, especially with younger students where everyone is talking or sometimes someone forgets to mute their mic and then the screen will automatically show them. I wouldn't recommend this one for large group meetings. However, if it's a one-on-one -on -one or maybe even three people in a meeting, Spotlight is an incredibly useful feature to have because you see the people that are speaking. And then sidebar gives you a neat little overview down the side of all the people in this meeting. And then you can see the spotlight on the left hand side. I'm going to select tile and I'm just going to leave it as it is and then close this. 
Now, seeing as I'm the only one in this meeting, you can see that there's only one video feed coming in. But as soon as people join, that tiled view will adjust and then you'll see multiple people on the screen. Now, you will have noticed in those three dots that there is also a number of other options here available. And one of my favorites is this one at the top. That is the whiteboard. Now, the whiteboard will open up a jam. This is part of Google Jamboard and this is all about communication because what is this? This is a collaborative whiteboard. So go ahead and select either a new whiteboard or a previously created jam that's already on your Google Drive. I'm going to create a new whiteboard. This opens up a jam, opens it up in a separate screen. So if you have multiple displays, you can always move it onto a second display and I can now start collaborating on this jam. Now, if you are in a meeting with multiple participants, before you see the jam, you will also see that share dialog box. That means that you will be invited to share this with everyone present. You can either give them view rights or you can also give them edit rights. Now, giving them edit rights means that they can start joining in the conversation. So here you can see I can start drawing. I'm going to select this pen. I'm going to draw a little circle and I'm going to just turn this into a little diagram. There we go. And then I can add an arrow. All done, I finished, but I do want someone else to start joining as well. So let's open up a second account and let's just pull that person into the same meeting. We're going to open up our second demo account. How is he going to join that meeting? Well, here in the bottom left corner, I can click on that and this gives me the meeting link. If I share that link with him, then he can join the meeting. I could also simply copy the joining information or I could always manually add them in a different way and I'll show you that later. For now, let's copy this link, let's open up the other account and let's simply go to that account. We're again going to have to give it permission for the camera, the mic, we set up our camera. I'm going to, for this one, leave it to the default webcam. That way it doesn't interfere with the other meeting. Let's mute the microphone and join this screen. You can see here, I get a feed of the other person but I will also see that here in the bottom left corner, there is a little attachment icon. When I click on that, I will see that there is one attachment linked to this meeting. When I click on that, there is that Jamboard. So I can now click on the Jamboard and it opens it up. Now you can see I need access. Now as a teacher, I can see their screen right here and let's go ahead and start a brand new Jam with them already present in that meeting. I'm going to click on those three dots, whiteboard, open a new jam. Here I can click on this jam and you can see a link of this jam will be sent to all the others in the meeting. Let's go ahead and click on it. It's creating that jam. It's opening it up in a separate screen and in the chat a link is sent to all the participants right here. So let's go ahead and open up our student account. Our student is right here. They can see in the chat there is a new message. A jam has been shared with them. I click on that and this opens up the jam. Now they do still have to request access. Now here at the top in that share option, I can change my permissions for the Jamboard. So when I click on that, so right here, I can now change this. Anyone within my organization can be a viewer or an editor. I can also change that and simply make it restricted or anyone with a link. I'm going to select anyone in my domain and they will be editors. So let's go ahead and change that and click on done. I'm now in my teacher's account. As you can see, there is nothing here on the screen. I'm going to just draw two vertical lines. Let's open up our student's account and let's see what our student can do. They're going to open up that link. They open up Jamboard, they get access to it. They see those two lines that I've drawn and they are going to add their own two horizontal lines. We're going to close this student's account down and you can see in my teacher's account, I can still see those two lines. So this is a great way of collaborating, brainstorming together. And if you know anything about Jamboard, then you will know that one thing it does great is collaboration. You can pop your ideas onto it and then everyone can just brainstorm together. For now, I'm going to close this Jamboard and then we're going to be looking at presenting content. Now it is very easy to present a slideshow or anything you'd like to share with your students within Google Meet. Here at the bottom, you will see there is a present button when I click on that, I get the option to present a Chrome tab, which I highly recommend. Using a Chrome tab will make sure that none of the information you don't want shared is shared. And also it just makes it much easier to know exactly what is being shared to everyone. You could share an entire window, say that you have three tabs prepared in a separate window. You want to share all three, well then you can use that one. 
or you can share your entire screen. Now, I don't recommend sharing the entire screen unless you are trying to troubleshoot or demonstrate something to someone in a similar way that we are doing this webinar right here. So let's go ahead and select a Chrome tab. This opens up all the active tabs that I have. And then here I can select any of these tabs I'd like to share with my students. I'm going to select my inbox. And then at the bottom, you'll see we can share the audio from this tab or not. I can leave this on, but for now I'm going to turn it off and then simply click on share. This now shares that screen. I can do what I want in this screen, but you will see a little notice I am presenting to everyone. And then at the top, it also says that you're sharing this tab. In Meet, however, you can see there is a notice that I'm presenting to everyone. I can always stop here or in that tab, I can click on stop and then it stops me from presenting my tab. This is an incredibly useful feature to have, especially when you have presentations ready or different things prepared that you'd like to show your students. Now, I did say you can start a meet from three different places. We started our meeting from Gmail. Well, the second place is to go to the website. We can go straight to meet. Either we can go to the app launcher here and then this opens up meet for us. So there we go. We can open up meet and then start a brand new meeting here. Now important, you can give your meetings a nickname. Giving them a nickname here makes it unique. And that means as soon as you leave that meeting, people can't rejoin it because it expires and the room no longer exists. So I highly recommend using nicknames for meetings. We're going to close this. And then the third way that you can create a meeting is using your Google Calendar. So let's go ahead and open up Google Calendar. We're going to dive into our calendar and we're going to schedule a meeting. So scheduling a meeting will save you a lot of time in terms of making sure that the communication is taking place at the right time. So let's go ahead and click here. We're going to say demo meeting. And then at the bottom, you'll see that we can add a Google Meet video conferencing. As soon as I click on that, there is now a meet room attached to this invite. Any guest I add to this will also be invited into my meeting. I can click on this button and that immediately opens up Google Meeting. You can see the settings have been remembered and I can join that meeting prior to the scheduled time. However, because it is scheduled in calendar, there is an additional feature that I really love using and that is attachments. You can get everything prepared so your students have access to the files they need access to during that meeting. That's something that's not possible when you open up a meeting within Gmail or you open up a meeting from the Meet platform. Calendar is unique in that sense that you can prepare everything, get that link created and then join the meeting. So let's have a look at what that looks like. Here we have our guests. Let's add our demo student to this. So we're going to add John. There we go. John is invited to this meeting, but I also want to add a number of attachments. So let's go ahead and click on more options. So we're going to click on more options down here. And then this brings us to the main calendar view. Let's scroll down and here you can see there is an attachment button. I'm going to click on that and I can now add my own attachments to this. So let's go ahead and add this demo slideshow. This is the slideshow we will be using in our meeting. And so I need them to have access to that. Let's go ahead and save this. We're going to go ahead and send that student an invite. They get an invitation. And because I'm sending them an invitation with an attachment, Google is now asking me what sort of permissions do you want to give that person to this file? I'm going to set it to view only and then click on invite. This person is now invited to the meet. I can jump into that meeting early. So let's go ahead and do that right now. We're going to have a look at the meeting, turn off my microphone and join the meeting. Great thing about setting it all up in the bottom left corner, you will see there is a little attachment icon. When I click on that, you will see that under attachments, that slideshow is available. They can open it up in a separate tab. They have access to that slideshow. I can edit it because I'm the owner and I have editing privileges, but you can share all the files you need during a meeting. This is great for online meetings with colleagues. This is great for online teaching. I've had meetings where five, six, seven different files were all added and it just gives everyone easy access to those files without having to jump around from tab to tab or window to window. So Google Meet, a great platform for your online communication, especially when it comes to video conferencing and online teaching. And that brings us to the next one on my list, and that is Google Chat. Now, Google Chat is very different from Google Meet because chat is really focused on text. So what are we going to be using chat for? Well, Google Chat is really used to create chat rooms. 
these rooms can have people added into them. And then you can add as many people as you want to the chat room, but you can also set it up in a way that it is really going to benefit that communication and collaboration. Because the way the chat room works is it uses threads, similar to email threads, but they are very visual. Now let's go ahead and open up Google Chat and have a look at what it looks like. Here we have our Meet. We're going to just close that window, close the calendar, and again, in that app launcher, you will find chat. Let's go ahead and open up chat. We are now in a blank view for chat because we've never used it with this account before. So let's go ahead and click on skip. We are now here. We don't need notifications. So let's just turn that off. Here on the left hand side, you can see I can find people, rooms or bots. I can add a chat by clicking on that plus. That means that I want to chat with a single person. I can add a room. That means I can create a chat room and in that chat room we have multiple threads or I can add a bot. Now bots are going to automatically respond in certain ways to messages that you receive. So let's go ahead and click on the settings first and then we'll create our very first chat room. Now the settings, the settings are going to allow us to make a few changes to how Google Chat works. Here we can see that I can have various notifications. I'm going to leave all the notifications on. That means I want to be notified of every message, every new room, every chat. And then down below, I have an email notification. That means if someone at mentions me in a chat message, I can be notified via email when I haven't responded. I love using this because this really helps you stay on top of your chats. However, if you have an incredibly active chat room, then this may be better off turned off. I'm going to leave everything as it is for now and we're going to start setting up our first chat room. So let's exit our settings and let's just click on rooms and then that plus icon. This allows me now to create a brand new chat room. Let's call this the Singapore demo room. There we go. We can add a number of names of different people that will be added into this chat room. So let's add our demo accounts again. We're going to add our different demo students. There we go. And we are also going to add student two. So we now have a chat room, myself and two students are in that chat room. I can give my chat room a little icon or avatar. So let's go ahead and do that right now. We can choose any of these emojis. I'm going to call it, there we go. And then we can tick this box. Now it's very important that you think carefully about what the chat room will be used for. Because once you've ticked this box, people from outside of your domain can be added into your chat room. Otherwise, that is not possible. I'm going to go ahead and tick it. And then I'm also going to notify people by email that this has been created. They get an email and then that's how they can join our chat room. Let's go ahead and click on create. And we now have our room that is being created in the background. The room is active and the first thing you'll see is that we can create a new thread. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to create a new thread. We're going to say, hello, everyone. Now this thread can be given some emojis. So let's just add an emoji. There we go. And we can also upload a number of different files. So here you can see I can add a little GIF. I'm going to add that GIF or GIF. If you're a team GIF, if you're a team GIF, let us know in the chat below. We're going to add that. And then once everything has been uploaded, we can send it into the room. There we go. You can see this is part of a thread and it has a neat little box around it. That's to show that this is a single thread. People can respond to this thread or they can create a brand new one. So let's create a second one and this will be all about PD. So let's just say, what did you learn? What did you learn today? And we're also going to give it an emoji. There we go. Let's add that emoji. Now you can see we can also add drive files or a Google Meet, start video conferencing. For now, we're not going to do that. Let's just click on send. There we go. Now these are two separate threads. That means that we can add messages to either of these two things. This is great when you're talking about different topics within a single chat room. So you could have a chat room with all your students. One is just an informal chat to make sure everyone is all right, especially during online learning. Keep in touch with your students, make sure everyone is doing all right. The other is really work related. Maybe they have questions and then you answer their questions there. And then you can have a third one with ideas or feedback completely up to you what you would like to use. But I love this format of multiple threads and then you can jump from thread to thread. Once you've gotten used to that, it will be a huge time saver in terms of communicating because you can really organize your thoughts. 
Let's go ahead and reply to the first one and just say hello. This is again, same account, but you can see that that is added underneath that previous image. Let's go ahead and open up a second account and let's show you what this chat room will look like to them. Now here we are in our second student demo account. You'll see they've received an email at the top that says welcome to chat. So let's go ahead and open this up and then they can click on try chat. This brings them straight into the Google chat platform and it will also open that chat room. Let's go ahead and do the same things, not give notifications and we are straight into the Singapore demo room. First things here, you can see there is a thread at the bottom. This is that hello everyone thread. And then at the top we have the PD thread. So let's go ahead and reply to that first one. Doing great. And there we go, we're going to just reply that and press send. You can see my name is attached to that and the other account will now immediately see that someone has responded to this. What that means is they can now do two things. They can either leave a little reaction. So let's go ahead and give it a happy face. There we go. You can see we've left a reaction to this comment. But what we can do is we can also click on the other option. This is forward this message to my inbox. Say that this is important information or it's something that you'd like to use within your Gmail and then follow up and have a formal conversation with other people involved. You can click on that. This will now forward this message into my inbox. Here in my inbox, you will now see that there's a message, it's been forwarded. And when I open that up, you can see that entire thread is right there. I can open the message in chat or I can see all the images that were sent. This is a great way of really moving things from one platform into another so that you can make sure that all the communication happens smoothly with the right people and always in a place that is comfortable for those people that will be receiving your messages. Not everyone likes using chat rooms, not everyone likes video conferencing and not everyone likes a flood of emails coming in. So using this, you can use chat to then forward it to your Gmail. Now, another thing I use a lot in Google chat that is adding people or at mentioning people. So let's go ahead and do that now. Here in this PD thread, we're going to at mention that student. So let's go ahead and type at and you can see it automatically pre-populates it and we're going to just add student too. There's a little green dot next to that student. That means the student is online. So let's go ahead and click on that. We can add mention them. How about you? There we go and send. This person is now notified. They will hear that message coming in. They see that there's a new message. They can click on it and it highlights the fact that you've at mentioned them by visually adding a color. This is great when you're really trying to single out a single person and you want to mention them in your comments, but you still want that comment to be available to everyone else and you want it as part of your chat room. At mentioning will make a huge difference in terms of making sure that they are aware of what's happened because whenever you at mention someone, they will get an email notification when they haven't responded. Now, where do we turn this on or off? As I've shown you before in the settings up here, you can scroll down and you can receive an email when you are at mentioned. This can obviously be turned off and then they will only see that highlighted color within the application. And that is Google Chat. Which brings us to the next platform within G Suite that can be used for communication and that is the Google Groups application. Now Google Groups has also gone through a revamp and it now looks much better than it used to. I love the new interface, it's much easier to navigate. So let's have a quick look at Google Groups and what we can use it for. Now I'll show you how you can use Google Groups to create an email list. You can have a single email address and then it sends the message to everyone. You can use Google Groups for discussion groups and you can give different members of that group different permissions. And that's the real strength of Google Groups. It's like an online forum where different members can be moderators or even admins of groups. So let's go ahead and open up Google Groups. We're going to dive onto our demo account right here and then click on the app launcher. The app launcher, scrolling down, you'll find groups. If you don't see it, scroll all the way down until you find it. Alternatively, you can also type groups.google.com in your URL or in your Omnibox, and then that will open up Google Groups. I'm now in groups. I'm not a member of any groups, and I don't have any groups created yet. Let's go ahead and create our very first group. Here on the left-hand side, I'm going to create a group. I'm going to name this Demo Group Singapore. Let's go ahead, Demo Group Singapore. 
This demo group will get a single email address. You can see that here, demo group, and then Singapore, and then I can give my group a description. I can tweak this email address. I can change the domain it belongs to. We don't have to add a description, but it does make sense to add a description. So a demo, a demo group for the Singapore Google Learning Webinar. There we go. We're going to click on next. Now the next step is the privacy settings. Now this is the most important part of setting up your Google group. If you get it right from the beginning, you'll have a lot less work and a lot less time wasted later on tweaking and changing these settings. However, you can always change them later. Right now we can see who can search for this group while well, everyone in my organization can find the group. I could also choose that anyone on the web can find this group and then it becomes a public forum. I'm going to limit it to the organization. We can also have who can join this group. Anyone in an organization can join, but we have a number of additional features here. We can have only invited users, a very specific private group. Anyone in the organization can request to join the group, but you have to approve it first. Anyone can join, anyone can ask. Anyone on the internet can ask to join the group. Doesn't mean they have to be Latin, but they can ask or anyone can join. There is no filter. They can just join your discussion board. These settings are incredibly useful, especially when we're talking about small group professional development, colleagues exchanging ideas with each other, subject teams getting together and doing their work, they're planning their brainstorms. This is where you can do that. Google Groups is incredibly powerful and it is so useful for those small group discussions. I'm going to say anyone in the organization can ask to join. So there we go. Now, who can view the conversations? And you'll see that there are five different dots here. That's because there are five levels of permission. This one is anyone on the web. So anyone on the web can view our conversations or post messages. One down is the domain. So anyone in your domain can view post messages and view members. One down is group members. So not just the people in your organization that haven't joined yet, but also the people have to join the group first before they can see it. Then we have group managers. That means that the members will not get this permission or group owners. So you have an owner. In this case, I've created the group, so I will become the owner. And so you can really tweak this to make sure that everyone gets the settings and the permissions that they should be getting. I'm going to leave it to entire organization and I'm not going to limit anything for this demo. So let's go ahead and click on next. Now we can start adding our members. Now this is where you can manually add your members and you can manually invite people to join your group. So I'm going to invite the student account. So let's go ahead and invite student. There we go. John is going to be invited. He's definitely not a manager. Maybe teacher one can be a manager. So let's go ahead and add teacher one as a manager. And then we're going to have a welcome message. Welcome to the group Singapore. There we go. Subscription, this is how often will they be updated about the information in this group. I'm just going to leave it at all email, but we can also have a digest or an abridged. I am going to leave it to all email. And then directly add members. Yes, I want to directly add members. As you remember here at the top, I've added student one. Student two will have to manually request access and I'll show you what that looks like later. Let's go ahead and create our group. This group is being created. Everyone is being added. They are receiving emails. There we go. They have all been added and I can now go to my group. Here on the left hand side, you'll see this is my group. Within my group, I have two large fields at the top. There are the conversations and at the bottom, the people. Now on the people tab, this is where I can add additional members. I can see the information about the members that are there and I can also change their role. So let's say that I want to change this manager and just make the manager a member. I can do that right here and I can give them different privileges. Say that you have a discussion group with students. One student is leading that discussion. You could always promote him to become a manager and then he gets additional roles within that group. The other scenario is where someone steps down and then you simply make them a member and they no longer have access to some of the advanced settings. We can go into our conversations and here you can see that it's very quiet because there is no conversation. Let's start a new thread. Let's click on start a conversation and this is now a conversation and it looks just as if you're typing an email. So let's type up professional development PD in this group. 
that's the subject. And I'm just going to type some random text there for now. And then we're going to post that message. Now, because I'm the owner and the permissions are set in such a way, this message goes live immediately. Let's leave that message there because what we want to do now is have a look at the other view, the view of a member. So let's open up our student account. Here we have our student. That student is going to navigate to groups as well. Now this is student two and therefore student two has not been manually added to the group. So he has to request to join the group. Here we can see that there is my groups and recent groups. There are no groups visible to him. So he has to go and click on all groups and now he will see all the groups that are available to him and also all the groups that he can ask to join. Now you can see at the top it says all groups and these are all the groups available within this demo domain. So he's going to be joining the demo group Singapore. So let's go ahead and click on demo group Singapore. Now if you remember they have to be approved. So let's go ahead and ask to join the group. Here at the top he's going to ask to join the group. His display name is there. He's going to ask for what type of subscription he would like to have and then a reason for joining. Would love to join this group and share some information. There we go. Ask to join. Back to the main account now. You're going to see that this manager is now going to see that in pending members, there is a new student there that is requesting access. There we go. Date requested now his reason for wanting to join the group. And now I can either approve that request or I can reject the request. I'm going to approve it. And that person is now added into the group. As you can see, this person now has access to every conversation that is already present in the group and they can reply to that group. So let's go ahead and reply. Thank you for inviting me to join. And we're going to post that message. Back to the owner of the group. The owner of the group here in their recent conversations will see that in this thread there is now an additional message. Here down below, this person has responded to that group's message. So Google Groups, a great place for collaboration, communication, sharing files, exchanging ideas, linking out to different websites, and you keep everything in a tidy, neat place. Great for brainstorming, subject teams, incredibly powerful for those subject teams. Now I love using Google Groups and since the update, it is much, much easier to use. Next up is Google Forms. Now Google Forms is a great way of getting feedback from your students. And I just want to point out two different types of forms. So now let's go ahead and create a brand new form and let's see what that looks like. So I'm just going to type forms.new, which will open up a new forms for me. And then here I can start creating my form. Now the main thing to note is that this is a simple form. You're going to ask questions. You have a number of different questions that can be added and then you'll collect responses. However, if you want to give feedback to your students, what you want to be looking at is the quiz format for a form. So let's just call this a demo form. We're going to ask the first question, favorite color. The second question, do you have a pet? And now we're going to set a number of options. So the first option is green, blue, red. And then the, do you have a pet? We're going to add all. So we're going to just say yes, no, maybe. Now let's say that the correct answer for color is green. The correct answer for do you have a pet is yes. And we want to enforce that, but we also want to give some feedback. So if people say blue is the correct color, we want to tell them why that is incorrect or why green is the correct answer. If they say, yes, I have a pet, maybe we want to say, oh, great, I have a pet too, and then give them some additional comments about that reply. So the way we do that is by turning this form into a quiz. Where do you do that? Well, in your settings. Let's go ahead and click on settings. And then here you'll see that at the top, there is a quizzes tab. Go ahead and click on that and toggle make a quiz. This will now turn the entire form into a quiz. Now, if you are on Chromebooks, this is very, very important. You can lock your Chromebooks down. You can use locked mode. Again, this will only work on Chromebooks. So if you are on Chromebooks, yet another benefit to using them. Here you can turn on locked mode and that means that all the participants 
responding to your form will not be able to open any other tabs or any other applications. This is incredibly useful for assessments or for those times that you do not want your students to leave the form and just answer it on the form where they are working right now without opening up additional tabs. Let's go ahead and release the marks immediately. Do they want to see the missed? Yes, we can leave everything as it is and click on save. Now you will note that because we've turned this into a quiz, I have additional options for my questions. When I click on my question here, favorite color, green, blue, red, you see that at the bottom there is an answer key. I will click on that and I can now select the correct answer. Green is the correct answer. I don't have to assign points to this. If I choose to do so, I can, but I'm not going to do that. Before you click on done though, have a look at the bottom where it says add an answer feedback. And this is the main thing I wanted to highlight. This is pure feedback and communication for your students. If they have an incorrect answer, why? If they have a correct answer, what do you want to share with them? Maybe an extension activity, maybe a follow-up activity. As you can see at the bottom, you can add links, you can add videos, you can link out to different websites, you can link out to videos. Maybe you're using some tutorial videos or some instructional videos to really show them why the answer was wrong or how they can extend their learning and really go into that deepening stage of learning. So this is where you can add your feedback. I'm going to add some feedback for incorrect answer. Nope, not right. And again, this would not be considered feedback, but as this is a demo, we're going to go really quickly. Yes, everything is correct. And then we're going to click on save. So you can see we now have feedback added for these two responses. For this one, again, we're going to add an answer key. The answer is yes. And then we're just going to click on done without feedback. Now let's see what this will look like to our recipients. So let's go ahead and click on the preview. Our form opens up. I'm going to answer green, which is correct. And I'm going to answer yes, which is also correct. Let's go ahead and click on submit. I can view my score, very exciting. And here you can see that feedback at the bottom. This is where your links, your videos and your comments will be shown. This one did not have any feedback and therefore I don't see anything. Now let's change it and let's answer the wrong thing. So let's go ahead and submit another response. This time I'm going to say blue and no. Let's click on submit, view my score. And this time round, it says wrong answer. Nope, not right. And you can again give feedback to your students. Incredibly powerful. And that brings us to the next one. And that is where we are going to be looking at slides. Now slides has a feature called audience tools. Now the audience tools allow you to not only have a slideshow presented to them, but present it to your participants, give them the option to send in questions similar to our chat below, and then you can respond to those questions or even highlight them onto your screen. So let's see what that looks like in real life. I have my presentation right here. And for this presentation, I'm now going to turn on the audience participation tools. So let's exit this presentation. And next to the present button here, we have a drop down menu. I can click on that and you will see that there is a presenter view. When I click on presenter view, it opens up two windows. One window is my slideshow, and then the other window is my audience tools. So if you're using multiple displays, this is a great way of making sure that everything is in the correct order, that you know what's coming next. But the feature we're looking at today is the audience tool. So let's go ahead and click on audience tool, and let's click on start new. As soon as I click on this, you will see that my original slideshow now has an additional code at the top. Now that code can be used for our participants or our viewers of the presentation to send in their questions. There we go. I can have my name attached to this or I can ask it anonymously. I'm going to submit this question. Let's go back to the view of the presenter and see what they see. Now, as you can see here, the presenter immediately sees that a question was asked. He sees that on the left hand side. However, on the right hand side, the slideshow hasn't changed. That means that I can now go through these questions. I can either give it a thumbs up or what I like a lot is I can click on this present button. Now, as soon as I click on present, that question is highlighted on my main presentation. That means that students can send in questions. Parents can send in questions. I can present the question 
and then also answer that question live. This is an incredibly powerful tool, not only because it allows you to interact with your audience, but during online learning, this will also allow those students that may be a little bit hesitant to speak up or turn on their microphone or jump in the chat to still ask their questions. They can ask you the questions, they appear on your side screen, nobody else sees it. And this way you can pre-check those questions. And then as soon as you click on present, it pops into that slideshow. Now, if you remember from Meet, you can present a single tab. In other words, this could be the tab that you're presenting. You're not even showing them this presenter view. Once you're done, you can toggle this and now you're no longer accepting any new questions. You can still hide and present those questions that have been asked prior. In other words, you can spend 10 minutes, send me your questions, I will answer them later. And then as you're answering them, you're not accepting new responses. Once you've answered all questions, you simply turn this back on and you can again start receiving new questions. This is a super powerful tool for audience participation and effective communication. And that's it for this webinar on communication using G Suite tools. Now, I hope you found it helpful that you've learned some new things. If you still have any questions, make sure to jump into the chat below. We will be answering questions. Myself and a number of other trainers from Apps Events are present. We are there to answer your questions and we would love to hear your feedback. I'm looking forward to seeing you join many more webinars.